love them. I just uh, I went to the food store just down the street, and the woman said, uh, good evening. And uh, I think that has to do with the light outside. Uh, but uh, thanks, everyone, for making it through the, uh, the rainy day and joining us here. Um, on behalf of the National Theatre School of Canada, HowlRound TV, and the Spiderweb Show, I want to welcome you to our Saturday morning and to a conversation that aims to keep uh, our feet on the ground. My name is Sarah Gart Stanley, and uh, I'm your moderator for today. And along with Lisa Palmer, Artistic Director for the English Section at NTS, Rose Plotek, the Coordinator for the Directing Program, and the Director of Students, Carly Chamberlain and Tanya Rintoul, I'm supercharged to welcome you to, from where I stand, Canadian Theatre in Context. That was nice. Um, and to all of you listening or watching at home, I still hope you have your pajamas on because that sounds nice. Uh, a reminder to everyone here, this event is being live streamed by HowlRound TV. Uh, we hope. I think it is, actually, because someone apparently like my pants. <laughs> um, so, uh, I love you too. So, uh, we encourage you to tweet as you wish and to use the hashtag Canadian Cult, that's CDN Cult, uh, when you do. Uh, Spiderweb Show CA is delighted to be part of this, our first live stream adventure, and you can find out more about today by following us on Twitter at Spiderweb Show um, or by visiting us at spiderwebshow.ca. Um, this morning is to, is to be divided into three sections. Uh, the first section, each of the participants are going to spend five minutes speaking to us about their perspectives on Canadian theatre. Uh, and to find out more about our speakers, uh, you can turn to the menus provided uh, menus provided by our hosts, Tanya and Carly, or you can link to them as well through any number of hashtags like Canadian, CDN Cult, Out on TV, Spiders Web Show, use. Uh, use your, um, your uh, connectivity today. Um, tweet as you wish. Um, so after our citizens have had their five minutes say, we'll take a brief break and return to our long table discussion. Uh, this will last about 90 minutes, and, uh, and then we're going to finish off by awarding the Canada Council for the Arts uh, John Hirsch Award, which is really exciting too. So if you've not had the opportunity to place yourself on the map, Behind me. I hope you will do so during the break. Um, and as you can see, the room is set up somewhat non-traditionally. In fact, um, you might think I directed it because the sight lines are so bad. Um, <laughs> so we're engaging in a process called the long table, and it comes with long table etiquette. Um, and uh, hopefully you got this drinks uh, menu of etiquette, etiquette when you came in. Um, and again, you can find it online. Uh, the Long Table was conceived by Lois Weaver, who uh, in turn was inspired by the 1995 Dutch film called Antonia's Line. And if you haven't seen it, I suggest you do. Uh, Lois Weaver is a Guggenheim winning artist, activist, writer, director, and professor of contemporary performance at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, her work centers on feminism, human rights, and possibilities for public participation. Uh, Active for over four decades, uh, she's the founding member of significant New York theater companies, Spider Woman Theater, 76, Split Bridges in 1980, and WOW, the uh, Women's One World Cafe, um, also 1980. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to kick off by giving a brief modeling version of, quote unquote, from where I stand. My talk will be three minutes. At one minute remaining, I will be given a polite, understated signal from one of the hosts, probably Tanya. At zero minutes remaining, I'll be given a less understated, no time left signal. And uh, when I go one minute over, I'll be provided with some Juno award show worthy iPhone available music that will not stop playing until I stop talking. <laughs> okay, here I go. It all started in the 12th century AD. Okay, kidding. Um, <laughs> well, actually, it probably did in some way, but uh, that'll be for my seven minute talk. Uh, last night, um, as part of my keynote address, I spoke about my sense of citizenry. I know this to be a difficult word, but I use it here in a poetic way. It's my belief that we're living in a time of citizen story theater. That the citizen in each of us is waking up, and that as artists, we're doing what we do best. We're looking at the world we inhabit and responding to it. 
We feel as citizens and we respond as artists. This is our gift and our responsibility. Our stories must come from this sense of participation in the health and well-being of our world. And our goal must be always to employ our various skills and trainings to this end. This doesn't have to be onerous. It doesn't even have to be heavy. But it should be a bit awkward. It likely involves a bit of danger, for sure some risk, and it needs, at least occasionally, to be heart-stoppingly funny. We laugh as citizens, but we can make the world cry for this as artists. And when we cry as citizens, we have the privilege of offering laughter as a tonic from the gods. We, as theater makers, have the capacity to share joy and the resources to give space for the presence of agony. Theater is a space for contemplating in public that which is too difficult to think about or even click on at home alone. And in this moment of need, I contend that theater becomes a square for civic engagement. So meeting Lois Weaver, the divisor of this long table, in this way is part of why I love this crazy life as much as I do. Here's why. The woman accredited with today's approach to our discussion was a founding member of Spider Woman Theater in New York City. Spider Woman Theater is now, and for most of its lifespan, has been led by Muriel Miguel. Muriel Miguel has been one of the most influential teachers and creative voices in First Nations work on this land. Canadian borders are not recognized that's right, by many First Nations people, and this lovely line from Lois Weaver to Mary Miguel to the Turtle Dallas to Ryan Cunningham, one of our speakers today, both is super exciting and a testament to this. Equally compelling is the fact that I can pick another strand of Lois Weaver's influence and attach a line that passes directly through me and gets picked up by Mel Haig, another of today's talkers. And given this kind of easy connection, I'm pretty sure that never even having met Lois Weaver, that we're all sitting at her ideas table, not just because of this web of connection, but because we all end up being connected. The fifth Hopi prophecy is that the land should be crisscrossed by a giant spider web. This is largely thought to refer to the first power lines and more recently the internet. But as you see behind me, once the world is mapped, it becomes inevitable that we uh, will all connect. Our lines will eventually cross. We're interdependent. Last night I mentioned that we should always act as though we will meet someone again. That's how small Canadian theater still is. <laughs> but when I think of the map behind me and the ways in which we're all crisscrossing it, when I think about the Hopi prophecy and Lois Weaver and all of us here, it becomes impossible not to feel that our job is to live with everyone in mind and to tell stories that will help us all. From where I stand, that's our job. How's my time? <laughs> One last note <laughs> to all the speakers. Microphones are optional, but speaking clearly is not. <laughs> I let that sit with you for about 20 seconds. <laughs> I wanted to get to my music, but I'm not going to. So, um, with all this in mind, the practical and the highfalutin. I turn, who pronounces highfalutin with the G at the end? <laughs> I do, clearly. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, there's my music. Ah, uh, panicking. I turn this over to Tanya Rintoul to introduce our first speaker. Thank you. today is Paul Thompson, and Paul is from Charlottetown, PEI, and he currently lives in Toronto. I spent a lot of time trying to come up with one sentence to describe Paul and his career, but I was unable to do so. So I'm just going to hand it over to you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> that going to be 15 extra seconds. I'm just bringing another town. And you're a smart person in university terms, so you know that Northrop Fry has said England had tried to make a garden out of this country and they couldn't do it. I tried to fit 
into the Canadian Theatre at the time, so I was trying to be an assistant director at Stratford. I did brilliant stuff and they didn't like me. <laughs> <laughs> I was turfed out. And it was the best thing that happened to me, of course. And found Passamarai, where people were inventing theatre. Things were happening. I, it obviously, the, the model of trying to make the garden wasn't working for me. What could you do? And immediately, almost, I started this I, an impulse of trying to find our own stories. I did a play called Dukabors, and we didn't have the resources to actually go and meet the Dukabors in British Columbia, but we met caseworkers who worked with them, and we did a lot of research on this stuff, and uh, had a really interesting hit. I uh, did a play about hitchhacking, I got to go across the country and actually met the Dukabors who wanted to see the pictures of us taking our clothes off. <laughs> uh, in their little huts as they were sitting outside the uh, jail where one of the people were in, in jail because they had taken their clothes off and told her. There you go. Uh, there's a big movement in Toronto happening in the uh, early 70s original work. I ended up running past Marai and people came in to me wanting to do Canadian plays and I said, give me your Canadian accents and they didn't have any. Or it was like Charlie Farquharson and a French Canadian in a bad Indian accent. <laughs> So I uh, scrambled a little bit of money and conned some actors into going into the countryside and coming face to face with our landscape and also wanting to hear voices and see what the place talked like. The farm show was a result of that and in fact um, my wife reminded me the other day, you have to tell them this, these students, the crazy things that we were doing at the time, you made us lie on the ground, in the barn, and paint the landscape outside with your feet. And this is an exercise to try and put the, uh, our landscape on the stage. In the, in, the, in the play, we actually came up with a, a pseudo-Japanese uh, no-style physicalization of the landscape. And people said, oh, the farmers won't understand that. That's, that's pretty fancy theater stuff. And they got it immediately. They, you know, the gesture and the image became one. The actors had to literally lie on the earth and understand it as well as work with the farmers. That was very exciting stuff. It worked. It worked because they were brilliant actors and they were willing to go with it. But I then went on a, a, a trek of trying to find the different voices across the country and the different places of power where theater might be went to Northern Ontario, went to um, Petrolia, founding of oil in the north of, well, in the world. First oil wells in the world were in Petrolia. Uh, okay, Saskatchewan ended up being a huge, huge place of power. Saskatoon in particular for us. And we created something called the West Show, where Eric Peterson, I got to meet everybody in Eric Peterson's hometown, because in the process of making the West Show, he brought out every character that he'd ever known. At the same time, Linda Griffiths and Lane Coleman and a bunch of young people were at 25th Street Theatre, and they were eager for this stuff. So we ended up making two shows instead of one. They were so called, if you're so good, why are you in Saskatoon? <laughs> it was a huge hit, and it launched them towards uh, paper reading and towards hearing the voices, meeting the people. It was all coming out of the land, and there were these power places. Later, Saskatoon became a go-to place for at least five of our shows. Megan Pierre had its other town tryout there. We did the impossible play called Jessica, First Nation an experience of the highest order that Linda Griffiths and Maria Campbell ended up arguing over for the rest of the, Linda's life. And uh, all of that was about hearing the land, meeting the voices. I guess all in all, I think I've done eight plays in eight different provinces in one territory, and each of them has a different voice. I could go on for a long time, but I, we'll talk in the workshop a little bit more about this. What you have to know is you, it's never done, and even when you do it, it'll be done again. We are a country that reinvents itself every 15 to 20 years. 
and the theater that you guys will be running 15 years from now is not going to be anything close to what you have imagined it now. Uh, oh, I promise also one other thing. There will be blood on the floor and you'll be in bed with people you never expected. <laughs> I argued endlessly at the beginning of my career with a guy called Timothy Findlay who was fancy man, writing horrible plays. Not bad books, but horrible plays. And at the fifth phase of my career, I ended up creating and getting an author's title for Elizabeth Rex at Stratford. The whole world that, that had rejected me, the whole world that I've been spending my time fighting against for the last 40 years. So, love your, well, hate your enemies, but realize you might end up in bed with them 30 years later, 40 years later. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that he taught me, uh, 
And the entire class was, don't wait for people to produce your work. Do it yourself. And he talked about how, uh, when he was growing up, that there wasn't a lot of Canadian theater around. They were doing British theater or American theater. And so he and a group of his friends decided to do it themselves. So that was already inside me. And, uh, and uh, uh, so when I had, um, I traveled to Africa because I wanted to know what the roots of my own ancestry were. Roots had just come on television. I, don't know. I, go with, I go with the flow. And, uh, and uh, while I didn't find any of my relatives, it was an experience that I wanted to tell. And theater was the form that I knew. And uh, I would encourage everyone. I think uh, one of the things I do, uh, I know I digress terribly, but one of the things I do is I teach playwriting. I also direct plays. But I think I'm an extraordinary playwriting teacher. And the reason why is that, the reason why is that I have struggled to find my own voice. And I think I am good at encouraging others to find their own voice. I've been there. I know what it's like to get stuck. I know what it's like to be afraid to say the words you really think. So I am good at encouraging students to find their own voice. But for me, um, one of the most important things was finding a way to encourage more people that looked like me on the stage in Canada. And so, uh, from where I stand, also echoes a piece of a, 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 a speech given by August Wilson called The Ground on Which I Stand. I would encourage you all to find it and read it. It was published in 1996 in the American Theatre Magazine. And there, Silver. No, but there, <laughs> but there he encourages black writers. He says there can be no black theater without black writers. And it's true, there can be no Canadian theater without Canadian writers. And so encourage the writers is what I want to say. All of you, you're studying acting, you're studying directing, you're studying playwriting, find ways to write. Find ways to write your story. That's important. Thank you. was uh, born in Kingston, Jamaica, and is now based in Toronto, and is the artistic director of the Obsidian Theatre. Bill. From where I stand, <laughs> my daughter has tattooed on her feet. On one side it says, wherever you go, and on the other side it says, there I am. That's where she stands. Wherever she goes is where she stands. I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah? What good does it do to stand someplace and not know where you are? To not know who you are? To not understand yourself so that you know what you are seeing? We all have lenses that show us the world in a particular way. And you have to understand your lens. Otherwise, you don't understand how things are focused in your head. I, I work from a black lens. I, I run Obsidian Theater. And my lens, everything's got to be about being black. Right? But it is, and it isn't. Because... Your lens can be really narrow, it can be parochial, it can be ecumenical, it can be huge. But you have to know it, and therefore you have to know yourself in an honest and true way. I think of images of the Roman god Janus. You may see him sometimes, there's one head looking one way, one head looking the other way. That's where we get January from. That's where we get all of our rituals about at the end of December. Oh, what was my year like? Oh, I never did go to the gym. I will go to the gym. Right? All of that comes from Janice, from looking backwards and looking forwards. In black theater, 
and I'm going to generalize so I can get smacked down later at the table. <laughs> In black theater, there is a propensity for looking back. It's exacerbated by February plays, the black history play, where we look back, where we learn about Harriet Tubman, but we don't learn about Lincoln Alexander. We learn by looking back, we, place, we make simple stories that allows us to not engage with the complex stories of today. So, I went and I saw a, a show in Toronto. It was about uh, 20 black women on stage singing beautifully, and it kind of broke my heart because in this story were simplistic images of poor downtrodden black people who somehow find victory, and every white person in there was an awful human being. I was bored by that. that. That's a simple old story. And we live in a complex world and we have to open up our vision and open up our lens to take in the complexity of that. Lest you think that um, at Obsidian we just kind of do, if you're not black you can't come in the door. That isn't true. Um, and so I'll invite you all to come visit me when you come to Toronto. I'll take you up for lunch. Um, I'm not kidding. <laughs> so, uh, we, have, uh, we have a situation in a play called Shakespeare's Nigga, which I was directing by Joseph Jomo Pierre, a really raw, rich writer that I love to direct. We had an assistant director that I brought in from Winnipeg. I had an apprentice director who was part of our mentor apprenticeship program. I had three white auditing directors who sat in the room. One was from the directing program at uh, Ryerson. One was uh, an engaged person already working in the community. The third was a white community theater director from the Kitchener Waterloo Little Theater who made her way into Toronto to sit in this, quote, black thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> I like to be ecumenical. I like to be large. I want from where I stand, that other people join in that exploration of, of those themes and those ideas. I'm out of time.
an amphitheater is kind of beside the point because it has no impact on the world. So uh, what I did is instead of kind of uh, talking about me and my work, I just wrote down seven points. So I'm just going to start with them, about where I stand, what I see. One, Canada is deeply divided ideologically, but this might be an imaginary narrative that people are telling me that is actually falling apart. Sarah Stanley used that phrase last night, this imaginary narrative. And I think if you follow Paul's advice, if you go out and travel around Canada, you will not find us so divided. So I think it's time to realign that narrative. Um, my second thing that I see from where I stand, theater is underfunded, underattended, underpracticed, which is weird because if there's one medium that can realign imaginary narratives, it's a theater. So I want to accelerate that realignment in the work that I do. Three, collective impact is a big buzzword in Canada right now. We need to do things together, but we're so fragmented. We need to build a common narrative, a national story. But this is not about patriotism. This is about diverse people learning how to talk with each other again, building new language that doesn't immediately try to force consensus, but that allows for distance, dissonance, awkwardness, uncertainty, failure to connect as a process through which we have to pass through to find connection again. Breaking down useless barriers, taking the conversation away from experts and giving it back to the citizen, the true power behind Canada's democracy. By the way, democracy is a farce right now in Canada. I'm sure you all saw the Iraq-Israel uh, Google or Google it if you haven't, the CPAC video that went viral on Facebook. We are not connecting in the, in the most important political chamber that we have, and as citizens, we're not doing anything about that today. Number four, theater of the citizen is not just political, it's deeply personal, because you don't live alone, even though you might feel like that sometimes today amidst all the noise. You make political decisions every day in the way you speak to people, the way you spend your money, the way you raise your kids, the way you care for your parents. Politics is not reading the newspaper and being up on political affairs, or deciding to become an MP, or starting an NGO, or declaring that you're apolitical. It's a conversation we have to have with one another in order to share the planet as gracefully as possible. The lack of grace today in political dialogue is a symptom of this abuse of the true definition of politics. So I'm going to skip, skip to point number four. Not number four, number seven, because I'm out of time. There are not enough lay people in this room today. This is the one thing that I really feel strongly about and emotional about from where I stand, is that I'm afraid of us sitting in the theater and talking and doing great work and being brilliant people and not having contact with other people in other fields, scientists, business people, academics, children, homeless people, whoever they are. I would like those people to be in my audience. I would like them to be here today. I wish they had been at Sarah Stanley's keynote address last night because it was brilliant. It wasn't just talking about the theater. It wasn't a perspective on Canadian theater. It was a perspective on Canada. And Sarah Stanley should be a political leader, too. She should be invited to scientific conferences to talk about her perspective. Because there it will have an impact. It will change the way people do things. Because we are brilliant in the theater. We really are. The way we think, the way we create, the way we collaborate. We should bring that impact out into the world as much as possible.
Uh, for the record, uh, I, uh, as uh, um, Carly mentioned, uh, often stand on the uh, edge of the Pacific Ocean, uh, way over there in uh, Vancouver. It's a city called uh, Vancouver, which I think I am here in part to assure everybody uh, actually exists. <laughs> it does. Um, I hear rumors of other cities between Toronto and Vancouver, but I don't want to. I don't want to go out on a limb or anything. And I just throw, throw out to everybody um, that you know sometimes the margins can be exciting places. Sometimes in the margins, there's uh, more room to breathe or something. Um, I've been at this for 20 years since I graduated from this very place in this very room on a very ugly night in 1992. <laughs> I've tried to quit a couple of times, uh, for real, uh, most, mostly because the money's shitty and I find it hard to be both the, the parent and artist I want to be, but I haven't managed to quit yet. So, uh, 17 things I thought of to say about where we or I stand in no particular order. Uh, I hate the word theater. Theater, I hate the word theater. <laughs> the most profound regular creative experience I have is writing shows uh, with my friend who has Down syndrome. It is profound for me because I feel like it demands my total for real presence. Uh, presence is really important to me. Uh, I try to practice it and I like it when I uh, witness it or uh, share it in, in, in live experiences. I didn't say theater. <laughs> I am interested in performance or theater that makes use of the very real fact that everybody, like us right now, is in the same room together for real. Uh, my generation started independent companies as a way of allowing us to make work. Some people have alluded to that. And now we're pretty much in charge. And I believe many of you who choose to stay in the theater are probably going to have to think, as Paul said, of a different way. I believe jealousy and envy of others' success is natural, human, and inevitable. And what I try to focus on is letting that go. I'm the artistic director of a company called New World Theater that makes a whole bunch of different things happen that almost none of you have ever heard of, <laughs> partly because I'm from Vancouver, and mostly because that is, I believe, the nature of what we do. The theater is marginal. No one cares. For real. <laughs> At least not in the I saw you on TV way. And that marginality I know can feel frustrating, but I, I would argue that it also can be hugely liberating. It means we have the opportunity to say things and do things in ways that may never be allowed in mass forms. And not things that people experience alone in their apartments in front of screens, but things that we experience in the same room together. Um, often when I teach, I say, um, if you stay in theater, it might look a little bit m more like going into the priesthood than moving to Hollywood which for me is a good thing now, it didn't used to be. <laughs> um, this, here's my prop. This is one of my favorite books. It's called Improv, I'll talk about it in my workshop a little bit. I think it's uh, my favorite uh, because Keith Johnson talks about the deep intelligence of our uncontrolled impulses and how our school system can really fuck people up. Um, every time I've consciously decided to do something in order to advance my career, it hasn't. <laughs> I don't believe there is such a thing as a career. I heard a great thing on the radio the other day. A smart behaviorist fellow said, uh, we have a fuck up, fucked up idea of what success is. It's not possible to be highly successful at your job, in a relationship, and as a parent. Something has to give. I have a hard time with the fourth wall in live performance. I often think, sitting there, I know you know I'm watching you. Why don't you look at me? <laughs> Out of theater school, I worked a lot with kids. I worried endlessly that the fact that I, I came out of this place and worked with kids meant I was a failure, even though I loved doing it. Now I believe I learned more from those jobs about performance and who I wanted to be in the world than I did at theater school. And if you told me at that time, I would have said, go fuck yourself. <laughs> the industry, I believe, deeply needs producers and agents and promoters. And we need to pay them better and respect them more. That is an artistic need, I believe. If you're good at business, awesome. That's a really good thing, in my view. 
Um, this and uh, Annabelle, uh, it's awesome that Annabelle mentioned it. Anna Devere Smith is another of my favorite books. In it, Anna Devere Smith, um, Annabelle's mentor, talks about the individual poetry inherent in the way every single speaks. Okay, all right, last one. Here we go. Which one am I going to choose? Okay, I'm going to echo Annabelle. We need more theater in the real world, as Annabelle said. And I just ask you to remember that what you're developing is an actual skill. It's a real thing, one sorely lacking in many politicians, teachers, media reps, professors, counselors, mediators, and others. Please, please, please know that you guys are good at those things, too. Thanks very much. So uh, instead of talking, uh, you know, broadly, I'd love to give you some examples. So the way this first uh, appeared to me was a French show that I directed called Timbuktu, where we uh, finished with a debate, and then when the debate ended, depending on how you agreed with it, you would go at one door, you go at the other door. We counted those people, and then you had to come back to our website and find out who won the debate. And so that was kind of the first like way that we connected with theater, with the internet. And the amazing thing that came out of that was because it was a blog, you could have comments, and so often that debate would actually continue on the website. And so that kind of blew our minds open in terms of what we could do in terms of being a theater company that had no money but did have a website. Uh, so this really quickly snowballed into a lot of works, and I just want to tell you about a few of them. Uh, actually, anecdotally, one of the funniest days that I had thinking about this, I went and saw a play at Soul Pepper. And at the very beginning, uh, the stage manager came out and said, uh, make sure you keep your cell phones off. And uh, the show also, uh, really, we can't have any light leakage, so make sure that your screen is off as well so it doesn't light up the room. And then the stage manager just did a little throwaway joke. Uh, you can tweet at the intermission if you'd like. And the whole audience laughed so hard. It was like the biggest laugh of the entire show. <laughs> <laughs> because it was incredible, or in, they, maybe they were incredulous that uh, anyone there would actually tweet about the show, so it was quite a funny joke. <laughs> but, and so it would be very tempting to make this about age, uh, but I had a great experience that day which taught me that it wasn't about age because I went straight from there to rehearsal of Hashtag Legacy, which was a project that Rob Kempson had been putting on at Hatch, which I co-curated that year. And Hashtag Legacy involved set, uh, four women in their 70s using Twitter to try to uh, communicate their legacy at the end of their lives and involved live tweeting and them tweeting back the audience and them learning how to use new technology to communicate what their life experience had been. And so that really uh, elucidated for me how these things are about whether we're open-minded to change and not necessarily because certain generations are only open to certain kinds of change. Uh, from there, we went on to uh, take a play across the country called You Should Have Stayed Home about the G20 protests. 
And that play basically used Facebook and Twitter to recruit a cast of 20 that would be part of the show. You would, you would uh, show up one hour early, and uh, you would learn your part, and then you'd participate in the show, and then uh, you could go home and your, your friends could come back and be into the show the next night. And the way that we found all of those people was through social media. Uh, we had a, a show at the Free Fall Festival uh, in Toronto in uh, 2012 at the Theatre Centre, which I co-curated, which was called uh, Route 501 Revisited. Uh, and this is the only show that I've ever made where the TV cameras were actually waiting there uh, for me on opening nights to interview us. And it was because we took uh, uh, a streetcar, which Jonathan Goldsby, who's a writer for Now Magazine, uh, gave a live Twitter tour of Toronto while you sat on the streetcar. And uh, so anyone can get on the streetcar, get a tour of Toronto, you can tweet back and forth with Jonathan. And he wanted it to be a very quiet streetcar uh, where everyone just listened to his tweets. But of course he hadn't really uh, figured out that we're now in the area of dialogue, not monologue. And so it was actually quite a big party on board the streetcar. Uh, my last example is, many of you may know about the Wrecking Balls. They're a political theater that happened in a moment of need. Uh, and they happen often across the country. And uh, especially during elections, and in the last election, we connected with hashtags, and we had, at one point, uh, wrecking balls in uh, six different cities, all communicating about the art that they were making, uh, and really in resistance to a lot of uh, the things that our current federal government are putting forth. And uh, that gave me a lot of hope, that this technology is not just a new fad, or just like a way to distract ourselves, but a way to bring about social change and connect our audiences to be within our work and to have an impact on the world. Thanks. Is that something that people used to do and that you're not supposed to do anymore? 
And this is what I feel, feel about being a young artist, that sometimes we're going to do things that people already did before. <laughs> like, we're going to do shit that people have done. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that it's not important for us to do, because I need to know how people react to me being a lesbian now. Like, it doesn't help for me to know that someone else did it. Like, I need to, like, I mean, I need to know, like, where I, because I think what's mar marvelous is that, like, I am a person of color and I pass as white. I am a queer person and I pass as straight. So I have this marvelous choice of whether or not I say those things, or whether or not that that comes part of my identity as an artist. And what I've actually found is that it is the largest part of my current identity as an artist, are these things which I could choose to hide, these things which I could choose to just not bring up. Out of, like, I don't want to say that it's fear, but out of just thinking other people wouldn't be interested, or worried about the way in which they would be interested, or, like, we... <laughs> Um, and it is because of like the work that has been done before us that we have this marvelous choice as artists now. Whether or not these are things which become part of our artistry, whether or not they become things that are part of our ideals as artists today. And I myself have chosen, um, over various points in my career, to always move towards the thing that myself I actually want to hide. Like I can't believe that I just did that. Like I. I mean, I've been doing it a lot. Like, every coffee shop knows that I'm a lesbian. Like, it's, <laughs> they, like, it just does not come up. Here's me, you're Americano, and I'm gay, by the way. Like, I, uh, so I'm not so nervous about it anymore. Because, um, uh, you know, working at Buddies now, I am a Google searchable queer. <laughs> Which is a very different thing than just being living out in the world gay. Like now, my, I have a card that says I work at Buddies and Bad Times, and my bio, I've got articles in Extra Magazine. Like, you know, it's not, so in Toronto, in this circle in Toronto where I could have this conversation that I'm having with you, with anyone, and really not fear for leaving the cafe and worrying that someone's going to follow me or yell at me or hurt me, just because that's the bubble with which I live in. Two hours north of there, I don't know that that's the case. Like, I don't even have to say that we have to go very, very far to find different gaps than when we, like, and I think a lot of us train, like, we're in Montreal now, in Toronto, we train in these bubbles of, like, um, privilege, of, of privilege to, to be able to say the things that we say and to be able to um, be ourselves in a way that other people don't have. And I think that actually that's what makes us powerful is that we create these spaces where we can really be ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. <laughs>
Three years later, uh, Thompson Highway wrote the follow-up, Dry Lips on a Move to Caps Casing. Again, it was picked up by Mervish, um, remounted and produced by the biggest theatre companies in Canada. So, the biggest theatre companies in Canada, the Royal Manitoba Theatre Com uh, Company and Canadian Stage, Stephen Shipper, artistic director at MTC, Bob Baker, artistic director at Canadian Stage at the time, commissioned Thompson Highway to write, write the third play, Rose. Thompson had this dream of a seven-play rest cycle, as he called it, uh, loosely analogizing to Wagner's ring cycle. Uh, he wrote it. They refused to produce it. Rose has never been produced professionally in Canada. I would like to argue that Indigenous theatre, like Indigenous communities, lives on the fringes of our country. Um, indigenous writers are now finding popularity in festivals, international markets that are excited by the work that is being created by Indigenous artists here in Canada, but mainstream companies and mainstream stages are still not producing that work. I am honoured and proud <coughs> to be the Artistic Director at Native Birth Performing Arts. I feel like my role is to support all of Canadian Indigenous artists we are there not to create our own work, but we are there to create a hub, a lodge, a home for Indigenous artists and to disseminate that work to international markets because, quite frankly, we are finding more success on international markets, more interest on international markets than we are finding on the main stages in Canadian theatre. From where I stand, there hasn't been much difference from the time that I graduated from school 20 years ago. Um, but that's great because I am standing here. I am standing here and I have, I am fortunate enough to have the privilege of having English as my first language in this country. I am privileged to be able to read. I am privileged to have learned how to work the game and work the system and write the grants and network and be charming to the people who are still artistic directors at the main stage theatre companies 30 years later. <laughs> I am so excited that we are not waiting for our government, we are not waiting for our NGOs, we are not waiting for our business, because we are finding success, we are building partnerships, and we are taking our stories to the rest of the world, even if the rest of Canada won't listen or doesn't even know we exist. That's what I So uh, we're going to take a break uh, and be back sharp at 20 after 11 um, for the second part of uh, today's proceedings. Uh, enjoy some coffee. <laughs>
If, if you could change anything about how you're living your lives today, what would it be? <laughs> I'm 30 years younger. <laughs> Like real, like like actual, like fantasy change or, or like achievable change, <laughs> or fantasy change or achievable. Change. I, I, I think another fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> More time. More time. Like yeah. that's the fantasy. Uh, yeah, it probably is achievable actually, but I don't feel like I'm great at achieving. So why can't we slow down? Like I ask myself this every day when I wake up, the alarm goes off and I have to get my kids to school and then I have to get into the office and talk and I have to stop meeting and I have to write a play and then what if if that is in my control, how has it gotten out of my control to to try and slow down? Because what we're supposed to be doing in the theater is providing a space to reflect. Because if those of us who are making it under such a goddamn rush, how are we able to create that space? We're a poor form, and so it's hard. If you're uh, looking anecdotally, um, okay, I was part of the. Uh, I was talking about being part of the early wave of uh, theater, and, and it got pretty exciting in Toronto for a while with the invention of plays of all kinds of new companies, and for some reason or another, they thought I should go on the board of the St. Lawrence Center with a whole bunch of business people and, and, and all kinds of other, there were no other artists in there, and certainly nobody from the alternative theater was in there. And it was a strike. And initially, the management, uh, against IASI, and initially the management stood up against the strike. Or was it, and made it a lot better. And all of a sudden there was energy in this uh, St. Lawrence Center main civic theater in town like you wouldn't believe. And so, you know, the managers, the, the, the CEO kind of people who were in there saying, you know, what do you think, Paul? I say, this is fantastic. And what, why it was fantastic was because it was a way of claiming the theater back for the content of the show as opposed to the form, of, like the forms of the show. And this went on for about four or five weeks. No, so I guess maybe closer to two months. And then finally there was pressure from the city hall because a lot of the money supporting the place was coming from the city hall. And uh, it was actually a progressive group of aldermen and mayor at the time. I think Crombie was mayor. And we caved in. They caved in. I, you know, I was going to say, no, no, let's, you know, let's occupy and do whatever. And um, as I've looked at theater over the last amount of time, one of the things I'll talk about with my group is there's a real question of who owns theater, who owns the theater. Like I, Alon Nashman and I did a play at Stratford. It is hugely hard to do an original piece at Stratford, not because they don't want you to do it. They loved us. They, they kept hugging us and giving us money and all kinds of things. <laughs> but it was still hard. And we still couldn't get on the stage. We had to break the rules. But Nashman couldn't understand John Hirsch unless he played Hirsch's hits out on the festival stage. And we did that at 2 o'clock in the morning with a friendly watchman. <coughs> he turned his television camera off so we could do it. And a stage manager said, oh, I can't go, but it was a good fight. And that was what we needed to do in order to, because that stage is holy and powerful. It is one of the most brilliant acting, performing tools we have in this country. And it's owned by the unions. It is alien to original work of any kind of level. And that's just an example. I can give you examples of how the the organizational structures have allowed the energy and the power in those spaces to be depleted. Mm -hmm. And I would, I think, if we stood up at that moment, it would all have changed. <laughs> so can, I, can I just ask you, that what you just said came out of, it was a response to us talking about feeling this pressure of, of producing and, and 
constantly being so busy we don't have time to reflect. Is what you're saying that there's something about the system or the institutions or who who, who is holding the, the capital or the influence of the theaters that has disempowered us as theater artists from working out and imposing our own values? Is, is that what you're saying? I just want to make sure I understand the connection. Uh -huh. Is that what you're saying? You're eliminating yourself from one of the best allies of your power center by by not being able to do it. You, we do it in little rooms, we pretend, we negotiate how much time we end up before we actually meet with an audience. And in my understanding of theater, when you meet with the audience, the play isn't done, it's just okay. starting. We're working under other people's rules and, and time, it's time schedule. It's and it's structuralized it's, that, that is nailing a lot of that, as opposed to uh, being fed by the, you know, the. But many of us produce our own work, so it's yeah. not just that. There must be pressure coming from somewhere else. <coughs> I mean, well, no, I think you then. I think your structures are have been uh, shaped. Uh, my understanding is that a lot of uh, the emerging companies uh, feel that they can't move forward unless they parallel the, the organizational structures of the companies that already exist. The thing that connects all of this to me was, I will almost talk about this in my talk instead of what he did, but it was written by an American, so it felt inappropriate for this, but Mike Daisy has an article called uh, How Theaters Fail America, uh, which he turned into a monologue and around the States, and it talks a lot about how this organized, the, the institutions have become a place that are not necessarily artist-driven in terms of how they create the work, and just where the money goes from, and how those decisions are made. And because of that, that's why we have so many independent creators now who are doing everything, who are the producer, who are the publicist, who are the writer, the director, actor, because those institutions are not set up to serve them any longer. And so that's why we don't, I feel like we don't have time but, but in the life of every institution, there comes a triggering point where what, used to be, what the institution was formed for, let's say the creation of theater or, or whatever, at some point in the life of that institution, and it comes sooner than most people expect, it shifts. The, what, what shifts is, it's not no longer paramount for the creation of theater, it is now paramount for the survival of the institution. <laughs> right? And that happens to all of them. So if y'all create something, you know, 10 years down the road, it'll be about, you know, the, 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 the whatever your company name is, it's now viable for that to survive, as opposed to the thing of the work. I mean, that shift is where a lot of these, these structures get, get locked in. So let's say we want to bring Rose to a strategy stage. How do we do that? Do we sit outside and protest and beg and scream and kick? How do we bring that forward? How do we break this barrier and bring it to it? Just do it. Just do it. If I just wrote down after I, I heard about that from you, Ryan, and thank you. I'm so ignorant. I didn't even know about that. Um, I was like, get Rose, read it, maybe produce it. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I wouldn't talk about it. It's published. You can buy it on Amazon. So, so I'll buy it. Okay. Um, just do it. Just so, do it. Just, just do it. With and Cast of 17, it's a musical. No, no, what I'm saying is. <laughs> Can I ask you a question back? Why do we, and I'm not, don't, not just you, but why do we feel that our validation has to come from other organizations that already exist? Why do we look to Stratford or Shaw or the Theater Center, Center, the keepers of... They're not the keepers of your story, right? No. Yes. So then why are you looking at them to protect your story? We're not anymore. We never should have been. Yeah. The whole idea for that, the whole idea, the last 20 years, 15 years of my life of saying, let me in, let me in, was wasted bullshit. Yeah. Because it's, who cares if they let us in? They actually don't know anything about Rose. Yeah. They don't know about black stories. They don't know about your story. They don't know Marcus. They have no entry into actually producing the work that they have no idea about. Right. So therefore, we have to stop looking to institutions to fulfill our artistic needs. We have to do it for ourselves. And the funny thing is, is <laughs> that, <laughs> sorry. We totally interrupted you. Sorry. Now I'm interrupting you. Yes, you have. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
I agree. I mean, there were, uh, being fortunate enough to be in the indigenous theater world for uh, a little over a decade, um, my my seniors, the people who have trailblazed and 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 paved the way for young indigenous artists now in Canada, um, I, I heard them complaining <coughs> about these about the challenges they had to go through, about about the doors that were always closed in their faces. Uh, in the 80s, Thompson was quoted as saying, now that we have Native Earth Performing Arts in Toronto, there will be an Indigenous theatre company in every Canadian city in the next five years. Thirty years later, we now have a handful. Um, and, but we have a handful, and we are doing it. And as Maji from MT Space said a couple of weeks ago, we don't have to wait for them anymore. We, we don't have to knock on the doors. We are doing it. We are now building our own networks. We are producing our own festivals. We are programming each other's work. We have enough... Uh, allies and, 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 and peers that we are doing it. Uh, and and we, we don't need to be on the Stratford main stage because that's not who our story is for. They, they don't want that story. No, no, I, you have to watch on that one, in my opinion. The real power of what happened with Thompson Highway is that he started in the uh, space uh, adjunct to the Bathurst Street. Canadian Navy Center. No, Annex. Wasn't it at the Annex Center first before the Navy Center? Anyhow, that's uh, for her. Yeah, okay. Uh, and the power of the show took it to 200 seat theaters, to 500 seat theaters, to 2,000 seat theaters. Yes. Dry Lips, Pasmarai, Royal Alexander Theater, National Arts Center. The dialogue that got opened to the world was really, really important in that. So, I, I don't think we can, I'm sorry? What year was it? Right. I'm sorry, this is 2000. Okay, Kim's Convenience. I will give you an example right now. Yeah. Kim's Convenience, starting within one month, but use it like because of its notoriety, because of the word of mouth on it or whatever, and the appealing nature of that story, it, it has now been able to have a dialogue that requires large theaters, not just a 200 seat experience, yeah. not just a 100 seat experience. Mm -hmm. the and and, and, and I think that that is an essential. Idea. And what I'm talking about is the power of the space. The Royal Alexander is a powerful space. Yeah. And, and I, don't, I do not disagree. But I also go and I say, Kim's Convenience, which has been trotted around the country like the famous <laughs> dog of accessibility going, <laughs> so, started yeah. by Fu Jen. Mm -hmm. Theater, yeah. who's never mentioned in the in the yeah. King story. So the people who were seminal, the Asian people who were seminal yeah. to create and support yeah. that story, have been cut out of the history of it, and it's now trotted around as if it's this white red thing. That's bullshit, Paul. That's yeah. bullshit. Well, well, yeah. well I, I wish the author were here to tell us that it was bullshit. Well, well, I, I can tell you that he would say I'm full of bullshit. Because we've had this conversation, we don't agree. Uh -huh. That's okay. We don't have to agree. Yeah. Okay. We have to understand where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. And for me, the fact that, that Fujian, which was formed because they saw that Obsidian had success and could tell black stories, Fujian, future generation of young Asian artists, was formed to do exactly that. Mm -hmm. And they did it, and then, as in always, they got... Yeah. Their, they, their place in the story has been removed. Mm -hmm. That is changing. But you haven't removed it. I mean, you're telling yeah, the story because... here. It's being live streamed. Now I'm going to go look up through Jen. If that play had not been trotted around the country through these institutions, then at least they invited it. They saw yes. the merit in it. They invited it. Okay, And I don't know what happened between producers and they didn't get credit or whatever. But we are hearing about it. We might not have had and now you're able to participate in that conversation about but, who they are. But, so but I, you I see, we're validating a kind of, we're, 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 oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah, black. Yeah, but, um, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, that, and, and, that's, and that's the lens, right? So that's the lens. So all, all I'm saying is, that's great. That's great. And I mean, and, and if that's the nominal check mark for success, then yo, that's great. I, I don't for know. You. But for me, I turn around and I go, there's, there's lots of those stories out there. And because you don't know about them doesn't mean that they aren't valuable no, stories. No, it just means that I don't know about them. And I can't know about everything, right? It, 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 and, and it's, it's difficult, right? You want to be able to, to get your hands on all this. And we have tools in order to find out 
young people education. No, it's go. Stratford. Stratford. Where? Where? Okay. Who? Who here uh, grew up in the GTA? Um, and yeah. And who here saw their first inspirational show at Stratford? Yeah. That's where your love grows. That's where you see something. I saw the play first. It changed my life. I love natural history. We need to figure out accessibility, and sadly, so sadly, Stratford is that. That, in, at least from the downtown core, no, no, Stratford is that in the way that that's where you go on your school trips. That's what's used as our educational tool. That's where we go. It's infrastructure. It is an infrastructure, and so we have to work with it until we can just survive it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, but I've worked there. Yeah, I've worked there. Um, it was like being part of a huge machine. <laughs> right? No, no, but, but that's not that's not necessarily a bad thing. I was down there doing two plays. I was playing Othello and I played Crooks in I don't know the play that I hated. So <laughs> um, so no, it wasn't that way. Um, but but here's the thing. It's it's a machine. Alright? Shaw is a machine. I've just directed my second show at Shaw. It's a machine. <laughs> and there's good things with that machine as well, because, you know, it ain't a rusty Model A, it's a Cadillac. You need, you, need, you need help with your voice like that. You need Alexander technique like that. You want to go work with some of the best actors like that. You want to be able to go say, hey, Sean McKenna, can you help? You can do that. <laughs> it's, it is, it's a freaking Cadillac machine. But don't mistake it for anything else. It's still a machine. And you have to be good enough and you have to go. Now, you, we can talk about Stratford and Shaw and accessibility and color and all this stuff. I don't know if, it's, if, it, if, it, if it actually is of any use, right? Yeah. But all I can tell you is uh, the artists that have come to me who've been auditioning and I've helped them prep to go there, etc., or the, the, the actors, because I get this a lot, somebody's you know, moving down to Stratford on Saturday and it's 6.30 on Friday night, they show up at my office to say, well, what should I do, right? So all I can tell you is that it's, it's a place where you can go and grow and learn and have your heart broken and get great success, a, everything's there. No, it's not No, I'm speaking as an, I'm speaking as an artist going okay. there. Okay, I want to talk about machines. Okay. Because where I come from is a school, mm -hmm. and this is also an institution, and this is also a machine. And I want to come from that place and talk about the question of time. Because I think, I don't really want to tell you either, <laughs> and I don't know enough about what's going on, I don't know enough about all of you, I'm so glad you're here right now, but I also now want to go on Google and Google all of you. <laughs> and I feel like that's what's happening, is that we all come from institutions in some way or another, and we're not satisfied, we feel like we're not heard, we feel like we're not doing what we really want to do, and then we create other machines that serve us mm -hmm. and our stories. Mm -hmm. And then we have to keep track of all the other machines that are operating for mm -hmm. others around us. And there's not enough time. Like, there just isn't enough time to know about all the important things that are happening. So I want to return to this question of time and this idea of an artist within a system and how I find when I want to create my own work, I'm spending way more time constructing the system in order to do my work than actually doing the work. So I want to come back to that question and maybe like talk less about Stratford. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> less about NCS, but just about that thing we all share, which is like finding the system that supports the work you want to do and the conflict between how much energy we put into maintaining the system and doing the work. I, 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 I would love to respond to that because I have two thoughts, and one is super selfish, which is uh, Sarah and I have been working on Spiderweb show for the last year and a half now, and one of the things that we've really been pushing is this hashtag you've all heard 30 times already today, CDN Cult, but there is a practical aspect to, in terms of your question, which is that we're really hoping that Canadian theater, when stuff happens, We'll use that hashtag. And so if you're online and you want to know what's going on in Canadian theater, there is one place which is actually aggregating that information, which is a very practical thing. I would also say, though, I am really resisting this language about carving out time to do the actual work as opposed to the other work. Uh, because I actually find that, you know, uh, somehow how I'm sitting here with all of you today is because, uh, not because I went here, because I did four times and did not get in. 
But <laughs> do you have a record anymore? <laughs> because I spent 10 years running my own company and learning how to do all the things that I had to do to run my own company. And now I am the owner of my own means of production, to quote Marx for a second. And so no one can green light or red light anything that I do. And that's not because of my skills as an artist, that's because of my skills as a producer. But would you find that those are coming closer together now? Like, to be an artist is to be a self-produced artist? I, I think among a certain number of us at this table, kind of like I mentioned a bit, like in the 90s, at least I was speaking for Vancouver, that that was the response to feeling alienated and like those and we have fewer of those institutions in Vancouver, but feeling like there was, not only that they weren't accessible, but there's also a lack of trans, they were sort of accessible, but there's a lack of, the way they were, like literally a lack of transparency. Uh, literally, uh, when you would try to negotiate something or figure something out, people wouldn't say what they were thinking. They would hedge or play their cards close to their chests. Mm -hmm. And so our network of people, I think, evolved in, 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 in response to that. I think that sort of, for me, the elephant in the room a little bit, and some of you guys might have seen this piece about five years ago, some of the states uh, wrote it, um, of, like, please don't start another theater company, that kind of thing, um, which is worth looking at, I think, because that's, uh, like, I think one of the elephants in the room, as people of my age, 45, talk to you guys in school, is that, is that yes, we've, we've built that, but the, the fact remains that whether you're at Stratford or you're at New World, a giant chunk of the money that allows you to do what you do comes from the government. And people like me are now the establishment of a different kind, right. of a different model, right. and we're swallowing up all that money. Well, and that's what I want to talk to you because you have two voices of youth coming here yep. that are actually, I feel like our generation is more aware of the institutions before the startups. There's somehow a return in a way. And I don't know, like it, I hear in what you were saying a desire to recycle. I don't know if that's like mm -hmm. indicative of our generation. Question? Yeah. yeah. Like, re like there's so much already. Like I don't want to start again. Yeah. I'm tired already. Like I was born to start. Yeah, I don't know. There's something. Like I, I graduated from school like three years ago, so I'm not um, that far away from being in an institution mm -hmm. like this. Um, and so the first thing I did when I graduated from school was like there's a lot going on. There are a lot of machines that one can enter in, but you can't undervalue the people that are behind the machines. Mm -hmm. And so there, like these institutions can feel very, like if you just look at the shows and you just look at the like brochures, like it can feel like a really like alienating place because like now I'm working for two institutions. Mm -hmm. I'm working for Obsidian and I'm working for Buddies, but I'm actually still a person. Whether or not I am, I am behind an institution, and like my job is actually to make these machinations easier for artists to pass through, like to, to, and and I think that inserting yourself, like in a very, like actually meeting the individuals, can kind of break down that wall of of it being a machine, and like actually, like realizing that we are all people in within these machines. That it isn't it isn't actually like something that is like it's sort of like you say, oh it's the patriarchy's fault. The patriarchy is actually like a very clear system that you can break down. Mm -hmm. Like as, as are like theater that systems. You like you participate in and that you can like you can actually like look at how how feed these theater companies work. It's not like Stratford is this big mysterious fucking like the man behind the curtain. Like there are people behind there. Like and, and it's very easy to understand how they make their decisions. Because you can ask them. Like, you, you, you can actually ask them, and they'll give you an answer. And whether or not you agree with it is actually the question. Yeah. Um, I just want to jump in on time. Um, about a month ago, I started um, an experiment, a personal experiment, called My Intervention. And uh, it's an experiment in, um, in email and productivity. Um, and I was inspired by a 23-year-old um, guy who graduated from the <coughs> University of Colorado who decided to do his own year of personal productivity experimentation. Rather than going for a master's program, he decided to look at different modalities of productivity and how the world was impacting how he was living. So he did things like um, all day meditations. He tried to eat Soylent for a bit. He um, <laughs> took email off his phone. He did all these different things. And I found it really interesting. He wrote a blog. Um, and. Uh, and you can, uh, I can fill you guys in on it, because I can't remember the address right now, but a, a really interesting young guy. And it got me thinking about time. And you know, to hear you say I'm already tired is really 
um, it takes my breath away a little bit because it's like, man, like we can't be tired before we've even started to do what we want to do. And so that's what I began to think about with respect to freedom <coughs> and institutions and getting outside of buildings and all these places and thinking like how institutionalized I am being just by virtue of how I'm being asked to conduct myself on this planet. Um, and so I did a very simple thing, I think. I'm just struggling with it a lot. Uh, and for three months, um, I made some very basic rules as to how to conduct myself um, on email and to make a pledge to make my email um, uh, sending to other people as light as possible so that I wouldn't add to their workload. And then also to um, command myself to read, see, or watch uh, five plays a week to ensure that as the Associate Artistic Director at the National Arts Center that I'm prioritizing that, my, own, my ongoing education and um, knowledge of what's going on. Because it's so easy to just spin and spin and spin and spin and never get to the work. So when Wheeler says, you know, I, I, I have problems with that question of, you know, the separation, I agree with the complexities, but I also think that there's some larger institutionalized things that are in place that are making it difficult for us to just think and be and feel and relax and do all those things that we need to do in order to um, recycle, to um, to come up with um, uh, great ideas and to be compassionate to one another. Because when I'm tired, I'm an asshole, right? <laughs> Which I'll probably be by the end of today. Right? Just because I just yeah. I lose my, yeah, but I just lose my capacity because I need rest. I need um, to, to take a step back. And I just want to um, speak to, um, to, to institutions. Uh, when Jill Kylie and I uh, went to the NAC, one of the jokes that we made is, hey, we're the man now. <laughs> <laughs> we're the man, right? So two chicks and we're the man. And, um, and it's and it's true, um, we are. And I take that responsibility really, really seriously. I, I love the institution of the National Arts Center. It makes me crazy. There's all sorts of ways that I feel bad within it personally. I don't feel successful enough. I don't dress well enough. And I certainly don't know how to do dinner parties. But that aside, I love what that institution has the capacity to do. I love the theaters, like when Paul was talking about what it is to be on that stage, the fact that I break in in the middle of the night to, uh, to, to look at Hirsch in that way, to be on it in the, in the regular showtime, whatever. These institutions have the capacity to, um, to promote what we're doing on a massive scale and to tell our stories in a much larger way than, um, than the smaller um, interactions, which are in no way less important. Mm -hmm. But the institutions, and this is true, are us. We're the fucking institutions. Those of us who choose to come to National Theatre School are the institution. Those of us who work within any of the institutions, directing at Shaw, directing at Stratford, working in, we're the institutions, we are the people. And we keep removing ourselves from this as though there's something else out there that's responsible. We're actually the people who are responsible. It's really, it's scary, and it's embarrassing, and it's weird, but if we don't actually say, uh, this is who we are, then, then we're sort of, this, we're recreating this kind of echo chamber, right? Mm -hmm. That you were talking about, about no lay people here. We are the people living in this country, and we are the institutions. So if your idea is to uh, protest outside Stratford, I don't think that'll work, but it might. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? So like, my, doing it. My, 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 I feel yeah. like just doing it. Um, I feel like it's um, what I've heard, it's indicative of our generation, that uh, we are not waiting for the institutions for us to get the callbacks and jobs, uh, because we couldn't wait. So we just started producing our own work, um, doing off fringe. Who does off fringe? Well, like, like that was like, we did off fringe 20 years ago because we couldn't get into the fringe. So we did. <laughs> like, half an hour's nightclub in downtown Edmonton, half across the city from the fringe. And um, so we didn't wait. We just did it. We just wrote it. We just did it in parks, in after hours clubs, in gazebos. Uh, and we just did it. Then we started to learn, I'm speaking from my experience, about what the system of funding is. What are the grants, what federal, provincial, municipal levels, how to, uh, how to operate within that, how to utilize that, how to take advantage of that. Um, and I, I, I feel like not waiting for those systems to accept us, uh, we created our own work and therefore started getting uh, awareness from those systems of the work we were doing. Um, started accessing the funding to, to, be, to have larger presentations, larger productions, um, not waiting for the institutions, and therefore they become in a situation where 
they have a model based on subscribers, and the subscribers are the baby boom generation, and we know what's happening to them. And so now they have to reincorporate new models because they can no longer rely on subscribers. And so they're looking into the younger generations. What are they doing? How have they been operating without these systems in place? And then now we are becoming a system. <laughs> Which is great because we're also reshaping that system because um, that, that's how I've operated in my experience is that I, I can't get into NTS. I did audition too. Uh, I, I, I uh, you know, can't get into Strapper, can't get into Shaw. That's fine. I don't need that. Just yeah. do it. But it's, your audience. But, it's a, but it's a fallacy to believe that like every one of us should have the same goals of like getting to larger and larger. Like I, I have no interest. I have no interest in the kind of work that I am developing and the kind of work that I want. It, like it doesn't fit there. Like it doesn't make sense for it to go that big. Like sometimes. Sometimes it actually is meant to have a hundred seat theater. Sometimes it is meant to be in downtown Toronto, downtown Montreal, where the audience that it is speaking to. So this idea that we are on some sort of like growth continuum for shows is is a fallacy. Like that, that is that is not my goal. That is not where I want to be for the kind of work that I'm developing today. So and that has never been like something that I went for. So the fact that I am working within an institution is both because I acknowledge that like whether or not that's my goal, that doesn't make me any less a part of the system. But my question was actually um, about accessibility. I mean, it was about how we can bring the stories that are being done that do have that incredible impact to these stages, so they can be accessible to the audiences who don't. I do not find Stratford to be accessible. You can only get there by a car. It should be. <laughs> <laughs> To me, to me, I really, really think there's, pl there's places in the world that don't operate government funding and they don't have government funding because if you have enough people who are actually speaking to the people in your country, it will support itself. And my panic, and my, so I wanted to respond to the idea of panic because I'm a, a self-producer um, and I want to invite Elena to come up here too because I want to talk a little bit about institutions specifically in Edmonton because it's something you know and I want to speak with an Edmonton so Brian's here and speak about it. But uh, here, okay, I'll get to my point. My panic comes from the fact that I was born and raised by the institution, man, it's in my blood and the Citadel Theater raised me and injected the, I'm injected with the system. I'm part of the, I'm totally, I'm totally the system. And they're my parents, I love them. I love what I was raised on. All my values in theater come from literally the, the McLeod Theater in, in Edmonton at the Citadel model. Uh, the, it's built with the same model of the Stratford Main Theater. So when I came to the Stratford Main Theater, I mean, it's not even, I'm not making this up, it's not a joke, I had a guttural reaction that went like, oh, this is like my home. And this is, this feels like my home. And my panic is about, my, as a self-producer who's supposed to be this independent, the next generation, or something I feel totally disconnected from my people in, in uh, and I'm talking about Canada, and I'm wandering around this fucking country looking for who my people are, um, I feel really panicked and scared because I'm 28. I'm not really a kid anymore. I'm not, I can't run around. My panic is about uh, how, uh, it's about the fractured country. And for me, I feel an illusion of connection through social media. I don't, I don't really, I don't really think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's the way communities should be connecting. And I think, I think it can, it's a, it's a kind of fuel I can feel connected to people on, for, but it's got a timer on it. And I think we're lacking real communication mm -hmm. between our provinces and between our, and this is a general thing I'm throwing out there, but I feel a massive uh, disconnection from my people and what, as a, as a country in that thing, like <coughs> what the fuck do I have to bring to other provinces because I was kind of raised on this uh, system. So my, so my point about, uh, also one thing about Stratford is that I feel uh, you were saying, you were saying that's what we're raised on, that's what we were, that's right I think you made a great point in saying that is our, education, yeah. I wonder, it's, our edu it's part of our education. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we can, I really, I really don't think we can go to the institution and try to, I believe this now, I don't think we can try and uh, honestly convince places like 
the Citadel Theater to kind of produce native plays or to produce uh, the Citadel doesn't produce yeah. local playwrights. And just this one second, oh, sorry, I'm almost done. That's, I really don't think we can, because they, 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 you know, they've been around since the birth of theater in 1986. And they have not, I don't think, I don't think through maybe two or three artistic directors, take, at least I'm speaking from my province, the responsibility hasn't been, nobody's, nobody's, taken the, nobody's finally kind of made a stand and said like, if we, if our fucking building crumbles because we don't get the audience, to pay for this, then fuck it, we won't have a building, we'll do it any month, you know, like, well, because <laughs> somebody has to make a sacrifice and get kind of the money out of the way and figure out what people actually want to actually come to. Um, um, to so anyway, I'll just... Well, well I, I, I think it's, um, uh, it, it's ridiculous to, ex to believe that the Citadel should be saying the indigenous stories of this country. Um, it is not their responsibility, so why are we looking at them to take on that responsibility? Yeah, I, I know, I don't, I don't, we got to really do something, it's, it's not to do something. <laughs> but, I, but I also think there's a responsibility in those institutions uh, to their communities. Um, a kind of an indigenous idea about uh, being responsible to the community you are a part of. Um, and so I, I feel like these, these major institutions are separated from the community they are a part of, like the Citadel. Who, who is half their seasons are now co pros half their shows are American or... Half their seasons are American. Yeah, uh, and so um, it, it's unfortunate that there isn't a responsibility to their community. Edmonton has the second largest urban Aboriginal, Aboriginal population in Canada. Um, and, and so I, I, it's not their responsibility to tell the stories, but I feel like it's their responsibility to, uh, to their communities and to provide, to provide access to the people who have that voice in the community. And um, I, I, I do feel like it's encouraging um, the fact that, that the Citadel now has this, this sort of bar series in the Rice Theater, um, that there are festivals now being um, produced, like in the Belfry, they have their Sparks Festival, which is now presenting um, really edgier work. Um, there, there's festivals like the Summerworks, there's a high performance rodeo, which is the gem in Canada, Calgary, high performance rodeo. Um, and no one knows us because they're like, hey, we're in Calgary, we bring in the best theater in the world, so why are we in Canada? <laughs> 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 I want to present a quick counter theory to the, to the Rice Theaters. So the Citadel has a you know studio series called the Rice Theater, they're great. Actually, was that, who was that? Is Bruce here? Yeah, Bruce, yeah, I was talking about IATSE with you. And, uh, the other day, the Rice Theater, I, I proposed that the sole motivation for creating the Rice, this Rice Theater series that's like, oh yeah, see, see uh, we're going to open it up and have locals, we're going to have locals do stand-up and do jazz or whoever, like PJ Perry can come in here and whatever. And I proposed that the sole motivation for that was the IATSE crisis, that they can't afford to produce, produce theater in that place anymore because because they bring in solo performances from all around the country and they don't sell, the house is literally not big enough to support IFTPs. So again, I do really think, I feel like it was a last straw, or like finally turning to the community, but it was motivated by financial institutional. Yeah, so, so with that, I'll put the lemonade part of the story together because to make that right series work, they canceled all of their commitments to their local playwrights who were developing plays. Right? Wait a second. There's a good part to this story. <laughs> One of those local plays was The Gravitation yeah. of Polar Bernie Trimble by Beth Graham, a white writer from Edmonton, who I happened to read a copy of that play when I was on the BAMP jury for the Playwrights Colony. And I phoned up Beth and I said, Beth, I love this play. I want to produce it. I need to do it with a black cast. It's a family. I need it to become City and Black Theater. We have to do it with a black cast. She said, great. So because the Citadel cut those plays loose, that play was now available for me to do the world premiere of it with a black cast. It is now getting produced at Theatre Network back in Edmonton, getting a second production, and I think a third one is planned in Vancouver. So, yeah. you know, there's good work is done. I concur. Good I concur work. Work. with you. you know, I was in her writing circle, writing a yeah. play with and among her and I and the five other playwrights in that circle could probably all sit at this table and agree that all, and, and that I completely agree with you. And I sincerely am not. I completely yeah. agree. Like, and it's not even that it's Colin Doyle's play <coughs> that, so like in that writing circle and the theater network is kind of like, oh, this is fantastic. The regionals are, but I, I, Whatever the means are at the end, I, I don't understand a kind of undercurrent, a kind of a lack of 
respect in in uh, oh, where right. like what I what I mean is in these certain you know you're, we're, we're, not, we're not we're not in disagreement yeah you know, but I don't, <laughs> <laughs> it's not like don't waste your energy on that put it into the new work that's yeah. right trust yeah. in that's work. right and I just wanted to reply to the young lady who's left the corner's chair there I would just talk to that chair hi chair <laughs> 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 okay no <laughs> When you're out there, when you get away from this place and start working, you want to go into a room and get energy with other people. If you're really smart, you get people who are better than you and you steal ideas. <laughs> the best of the, all of the movements that I've seen have been a conglomerate of really amazing talents. The best of buddies was when these four guys were trying to fuck each other. And all of them were artistic directors. And one of them, was, one of them, was, one of them was pretty. And Sky was the only one that nobody else wanted to fuck. And all of that work was coming out, and they were stealing each other's actors. And it was the most exciting work on George Street in Toronto at that time. Just blew my mind. Cut to Summer Works four years ago, three or four years ago. There were these hotshot directors and writers, and they were all in bed with each other in one way or another already. They didn't have to wait 20 years like me. Uh, and it, I'm interested in what's happening to them because it kind of looks like it's disintegrating. One of the more brilliant members of that is now running this institute and has grabbed his wife so she's now, she cannot be in a room generating on the way that those guys used to work off each other. Others have been grabbed off uh, in the Stratford merry-go-round. So I guess here, here's what I'll say. You'll be inventing your audience as you're going along. And that's one of the most exciting things about the new work is that you get to invent a new audience. And when they actually get into a bigger space, it's really interesting to see them invented at that point too. But that isn't essential to what you're doing. That's a byproduct. Uh, all of that. Hang with it. Often, there's no economic return on it. Understand, survive. Don't put that as an expectation on it. And hang and learn and grow and challenge each other together. Because that still seems to be one of the smartest models that we have in this country. Well, I think it's the only one that ever works. Well, no, I'm sure there are others that ever works. But works despite all odds. If you like what you work, you learn, you're excited about what you worked about. Yeah. And you're going to do it no matter what. Yeah. I, I think. I disagree. Sometimes doing stuff is going to be great that everybody likes, that everybody enjoys doing it. It's going to fail. Nobody's going to like still it. Still do it. And, but you still, exactly though, because but you still do it. And it's about like I'm interested in creating lifelong artists, not single show artists. Like I'm interested. I'm interested in in like how we develop artists which can not just create one show but many shows, and whether that's with each other or as individuals or as and like. So when we talk about uh, institutions, that makes that that complicates matters. Like there is actually just something inherent about like doing this kind of thing with your friends and just like continually generating ideas and continually like saying shit that people disagree with. Like I am a master devil's advocate. Like I just make stuff up sometimes. Like I just make stuff up and like and talk about it until I figure out whether or not I'm actually completely bullshit. Like, but that's how you. But that's sometimes how you how you can make up really great stuff or terrible stuff, and both are valuable. I, I really want to uh, introduce Elena. Value to Annabelle Sutar. Oh, sorry. So I, 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 I'm familiar with you. Well, uh, yeah. I, I was interested. In are we now? <laughs> Fractured, uh, fractured country and stuff. And Elena started a started a festival in Edmonton, and I think it's a really good example of a, of a company kind of starting right from the ground, actually really really looking for the people in the actual place instead of kind of. And I really think it must be a tough haul starting out. And I wanted to compare notes because I'm surprised by you uh, relating to the idea of panic because I feel from what you described about your work, you're actually talking to real people in the country. And I just wanted to see if. Maybe Elena could share kind of what what you feel about talking to real people to represent the actual people in it. Well, the the festival that John is talking about uh, is called the Dan Festival that I've been producing for 
few years with a uh, not-for-profit in Edmonton. And so it's, it's uh, emerging artists uh, putting up uh, site-specific work, uh, all, a whole bunch of different disciplines it's curated. Um, and uh, I don't know, one of the things, in term, like we, the first year we did it, like we had, we started with zero dollars. We did a bottle drive, and that's how we got like the money to uh, put into our, our first thing. And then we started getting lucky and having some grants. And like in terms of talking about like uh, the dependence on, on or, or need to to be interacting with or working with an institution, like uh, I love doing my work. Uh, I love also being able to eat. Like it's hard, it's yeah. really hard doing like literally a year's worth of work and, and being like, I think we shall see a dime for this. And and like mm -hmm. and then also like in terms of the model of like what we do with that, it's intentionally done. There are a whole bunch of shows that happen like outside where we're hoping that pedestrians or people just walking by are gonna have no idea that we're doing anything and are going to kind of just fall upon it, which uh, is great when that happens. Our board gets, I mean, love the board, love the board, but our board <laughs> gets so mad at us, because they're like, what is this model where you have all these people, like, it makes it so impossible to track how many people actually showed up. It makes it, you know what I mean, like, you have all, all these people seeing these shows who aren't paying anything for it, but at the same time, like, that's the best. And that's, in terms of like actually having contact with your community, that's the kind of work that I'm interested in creating. But again, it's hard because uh, phone bills and internet bills mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So and like when you're offered the artistic director position at the Citadel Theater, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or, mm -hmm. your friend. Uh, could you, I'll just quickly jump in just, just on that. Like I would argue that uh, there is something that the artistic director, and I, somehow all these conversations always end up being about the big theaters. Uh -huh. um, but, but there's something I believe that the, art, the artistic director of the uh, Citadel Theatre can do, um, or the artistic director of the Arts Club, uh, our version of that in Vancouver. I think there is something that they can do, and I think that, I, I believe they hoard capital. Um, uh, they have access to, uh, like it's actually, a, it's like I grew up in business family, so it's like I like words like that. But, um, <laughs> but they, they do, they have, they, have, uh, they have pools of resource that they could act, I believe they could act as kind of more like venture capitalist investors, mm. literally, and like disseminate money into the community as opposed to feeling like they have to own everything. That everything has to be something that they own. And I think um, the best ones do do that. I mean, I know Roy's in the room, and I know Roy here in Montreal. He yeah. has festivals of new work. He, yeah. he, he goes out and he sees what young people are doing in the city. Okay, that's not where all this capital is going, but there is a there's there's an attempt at least to say what are the voices outside of my institution. I'll bring them into the institution. It might be a failure because it might not work with my audience. But something interesting is going to happen there, and so that's where I like to get away from this dialectic of institution one thing, like emerging artists other. I think that we have to be in contact with one another. You, the, the young lady sitting at the table here, uh, you walk through that gateway that was part of your history or the introduction to, to, to theater. You can do what you want with that. You can go back, you can never go back. But having passed through there does not change you with the sort of bad blood of the institution. It's just that's what's happening out there, and you can get in dialogue with that or not. But I think that what I'm hearing around this table most of all is just whatever, just do it, just work, and in the work you will get into conversation. And you know, you did a ball drive to, to start your work. I mean, I, 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 that is unbelievable to me. Like that was just my mind. You know, then you started getting grants because it's like you, you need money. It is out there. And it, the, where there's the world, there's a way. And of course, some people have a lot of jokers in their pack, and I did. I was one of those people who could borrow money from my parents to, to write my first play. But eventually, in order for the good work to emerge, you got to stand on your own two feet. You got to produce good work. And you're only going to do that after failures and many attempts, but just keep in contact and don't say this person is one thing and I'm another, like, and that we will we not <coughs> have contact. This is a great example. We're in an institution right now. Look at what these people have done by like, actually creating an event that breaks down barriers and puts us all at the table. Can I say one thing, and that is you for sure, and then I'm going to go sit down again. And that's where I'm going to talk again. I just want to say one thing because there's a lot of talk about. about keep making shows, keep making the work happen, all that kind of stuff, which I absolutely believe. But I just want to say, refer back to something I said when I was talking up there, which I just really think is super important to me. 
and in my case, because of my experience. That, that lifelong artists, as Mel talked about, I believe lifelong artists do other things too. Yeah. They go, but they leave, that I left, you, they come back, and then again, doing what, like this is real, this skill that is happening right now. Like getting up and speaking at a table when you don't know anybody or whatever. Like these are real things and the world needs them, I believe. And that kind of arbitrary definition between, like if I'm making shows, that's real work, and if I'm doing something else, totally. it's not. I think that that's, a, that's an important totally. um, distinction. Totally. Okay. <laughs> I would just like to pose a question to all the theaters Shows and finding work and just doing it, and if it fails or if it's successful, but like, what does that mean to you? Like, what is you learn success? more when you fail? Yeah, like, what is success? And what is it's I, I totally agree. It's just, it's just you, you feel a connection or you don't, and it's in the room when you rehearse, and it's in the audience, you know, with the audience when you're experiencing a story. Uh, it's a taut line or it's slack, and that's just something you get to feel, as, and, and that's where you try and always. Get it. Locate that that connection that we need to be in this room. Like sometimes when I'm sitting, like uh, having to experience one of my plays, and it's so excruciating. So I'm like, no one needs to be here. No one fucking needs to hear this story. What am I doing here? How do these people pay for these tickets? That's failure. But it's not a failure that's useless. Useless, okay? Because it could be that first of all, it's not the right time for that play, or this is the wrong audience, or I'm in the wrong place. But there's information coming out of the experience that if I was too cowardly to sit in my audience and hear it, I wouldn't get that information, right? And then I wouldn't know, you know, how to proceed and go next. Because let's face it, we all do know what success feels like. It feels alive. It feels like a risk. It feels awkward. It, but it's, but it's. It's a lot. I guess maybe a lot is the best word to to explain it. I would like to say that I, I believe that idea of success is completely from a place of privilege. The idea of success that you're getting people to buy your tickets that are twenty to fifty dollars a thing is from a place of privilege. But that means said that, that. No, that that means that you are in a place that you are being supported, and success is a, is a, is a popularity, monetary thing. So is it the word? Is it the word that you have a problem with? I know. Because I think we're talking around a word that's been introduced here. Right. You heard, well, I'm, I'm speaking from a place where success is just getting our stories on the stage. Totally. Success is, is not even having an audience. Yeah. Because there isn't an audience. That, that the Aboriginal people in our country don't even know, have never been to. But you said you found theater. audiences outside of Canada. Like, okay, when you put on a play, okay, and so you might not find it in Canada. No, but the, then you did, but. The, the idea of success. And what you're talking about is, I feel like it's, it's, it's sort of somehow a part of the ticket sales. Uh, we just did uh, an event in Edmonton, Alberta Aboriginal Arts, where we, a one-off event at the, at the Shopter Theatre, 700 seats. Um, it was an Aboriginal play from uh, Aboriginal Youth Program, the SORT program. Uh, it was predominantly Aboriginal audience, and my co-producer, co-founder, Christine, uh, and the preamble before the show, um, and the mayor was there, um, he, she asked, all right, how many people in the audience are Aboriginal? Most hands went up at the 700 seat theater. She asked, how many people have ever been to the Citadel Theater before? Uh, Same hands went up into the audience. Um, the idea of success, where I come from, is the fact that that was the first time they'd been in the, in the Citadel Theater. So uh, this idea of success, type of ticket sales, type of getting an audience, getting good reviews. She asked the question, how do you measure success? She never said anything about ticket sales. You yeah. brought that up. Yeah. And that's no, you, you mentioned the ticket price yours. No, no, I didn't. I, well, I, maybe I did, but I... I you mentioned ticket price. But I, 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 what's interesting is that when a question gets asked, you know what I mean, all, it's, we all project it's crazy, but it's actually not. Yeah. It's 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 not. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. 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 Ye
way. And to take that path. So I guess I'm just, we need to question, yeah, how do we define success for ourselves as a generation? I, if we're all tired. We're all born totally fucking exhausted. Right? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I thought I earned my time. <laughs> about marketing, butts in seats, I think was a big word, um, right? Audience development and outreach, which is a code word for let's do um, a diverse play and bring all those people in because we want butts in seats. And they said, that was a great meeting. Does anybody have any ideas about what you'd like to do the next time? Another. And I said, what I would like to do is talk about the art. Because we all know about marketing. We all know we do the same things. We throw it up against the wall. And it's a mystery. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you got to box up. Sometimes you don't. And you know what? We all do the same thing. It's the same dirty fruit going on the wall. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. But about the art. What is it about the art? What do you want to make? What, what makes you... Well, it makes you get all kind of, yeah, like that, yeah. over a piece. And it doesn't matter what it is, but I think it's important that we talk about what is it that, that turns us on? What is it, you know, that makes us excited about our art? But, Philip, I think you're leading to something that's been missing to me in this whole conversation, which is that our chosen form of art requires those butts and the seats mm -hmm. and there's a there's they're not two separate things the butts and the seats and the thing we're throwing on the wall but this whole thing about talking about the institution and all that sort of stuff is sort of danced around the like well who are we creating it for I, I, I will tell you right now as somebody who's in the end of his first week of a play that sold out as a Shaw festival right mm -hmm. That we brought to Toronto, <coughs> who I had 20 people in the audience last night. There were 200 people ready to pay $70 a ticket at the Shaw. I can't get more than 20 people to pay $20. If I rely on butts in seats for my feeling of success, I'm pooped. I, I, I'm done. And so I'm trying to say, I, I, I'm just, this is my own personal belief. It's about why you choose a story. What makes you hard? What makes you wet? What makes you excited? What makes, if you aren't doing that, if you can't find, if you can't define your art in that term, then I think all we've done is wonderfully created many institutional minds. And we can't do that. But on the flip side, what's the point of getting hard in a vacuum? You know what I mean? Well, I can't, I can't answer that for you. <laughs> that for you, but I can tell you that, that I still keep going out for stories that need to be told. I go out for a necessary theater. If I'm doing a play called Shakespeare's Nigga, oh yeah, that's a terrible title. <laughs> right? But I believe in the story. Right? I may spend two years saving up enough surplus to make sure I can produce it. It won't damage the company. But it's a necessary thing. What is necessary, Carly, for you to say? What is and and, and, and yeah, you can conceptualize, you can frame. What I'm saying is the heart of it is what is necessary? What is necessary for you, for you, for you, for anybody here? What do you have to say? 
and then let the rest of it work its way out. Because you know what? There are great people who can figure that shit out. But it starts, it has to start from the necessary fear. And I think you're like totally absolutely right. But I just want to say that I think I 100% agree with you. And I think the big problem is that when we say bums in seats, it's being misinterpreted here as money. Okay? So we're, as we are viewing bums in seats as money somehow. And what Elena said earlier, I'm touching this. Is that she doesn't care about the money. She's saying she's putting on street art and people can come and see the art. And for her, well, actually, I don't want to say that because I don't know. But the idea of success is like people seeing the work. I want people to see the work. If I didn't want people to see the work, I would write in my diary and sit at home and write my diary. Okay? I create theater so that people can come and see it. I don't see a bum in a seat as money. I see a bum in a seat as someone that I'm telling a story to. It's the last And you the cannot piece. have theater without an audience. <coughs> yeah. So yes, it is important to, to figure out what kind of art you want to make and go and focus on that, yes. But um, thinking about who our audience is and how to speak to those people is not what I view as success as a theater artist. And I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything about success. In but, fact, I'm trying to pull, it, pull the conversation away from that. And, and, and say, yes, of course you're right. Sure. I'll also say, um, Pete wrote a really interesting diary that today is still a definitive test of what was life was like in that time. So perhaps if you actually did write that diary, it would be as important a piece of art as anything else in this world. Right? So that's, that's just one. Yes, of course. Sure, Ryan wants to create work that's going to speak to an Aboriginal community. I want people to go back. But, but, be, but take the step back from that. If we take that as a contextual given, what I'm talking about is what is the work that makes you passionate? That's what I'm talking about. I, I, I really, Lord knows, I, I understand all those other arguments. I really do. And, I, and, and I'm not disagreeing. But I'd really love us to get back to what, what makes us what makes us desire as an artist? Well, it's interesting because um, I, I love producing now. I'm an artist, and what has excited me about producing is seeing stories that gets me hard in the vacuum. Um, it's just like, yeah, like it, and I, that's what I love. And it. it's, it's opened this whole world for me in terms of the, the arts world and industry as being a producer and seeing it. As, I, I also come from a place of privilege where English was my first language in this country. And I know how to read, and I know how to uh, work my way through grants, and, and how to write those based on the criteria put forth. Um, and so uh, I, I get really excited when I see a story that makes me excited, and I know and have the capacity to get that story to audiences. Mm -hmm. uh, when I saw Abukwe, uh, when it was uh, remounted at the National Arts Center after, after winning six door awards at Buddies and Bad Times Theater, um, I said, how the hell can we get this play to Canada, the rest of Canada? Uh, while we say and Ed Boy went to Buddies, they're like, no, it's done, whatever. So we banded together, we did it, we made it happen. I saw Cliff Cardinal's Hot, same thing. So excited by this work. How can we bring yes. it to Edmonton? How can we move it forward? And it's so <laughs> fortunate that Jonathan and Sarah at the National Arts Center think the same way as well. This is such a great story. How can we get it out to a wider audience, international audience? And this is so exciting. This is. Uh, I won't say successful, but I think <laughs> like, I feel successful because I'm so excited by this, and it's, it's, it's getting out there. And I'm not relying on on. And I'm not having to try and get the door open at Stratford or Shaw or the Arts Club or the Citadel because I'm finding other avenues. I'm I'm not making it happen and being able to find those partnerships that feel the same way. That's really exciting. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that since you're talking about art, I'm talking about art. Too. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the time you were saying that you had. You're having people line up around the block, willing to pay seventy dollars to see the show, but then no one would see it in Toronto. I don't understand why that's a bad thing to have that Shaw and be getting the story out there and using that to our advantage. To like, okay, you want to? I didn't say it was a bad thing. Okay. No, it's it's just a thing. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, because because I don't I don't go looking for. I mean, I, I don't go looking for larger theaters to produce our work. Right? That, that actually is of very little interest to me. And the minute that I adopted that and said, what I'm going to concentrate on is making the best work, 
and I'm going to have a theater company whose job it is is to help other people make their best work. Once I've done that, then all of a sudden people come and say, oh, we love your work and we like to produce it. I say, okay, that's fine. But part of Mel's job at Obsidian is to be a free dramaturg to anybody in the city who wants it. Obsidian pays her. So that if you've got a play, or you've got a play, you can come and you can talk to Mel. She'll work with you. And if there's a simpatico of ideas, she'll help you for as long as you need it. And it doesn't even have to be in Toronto. I mean, we, we deal with people across the country, right? Because it's not, to me, you want to talk about success? That's the biggest success we've got going. I, I want to pick up on that because we've been talking a lot about institutions. And uh, actually, I also want to just bring in a tweet that we had from outside about these things. Because uh, it's been noted on Twitter by Holger Stein, who is a prolific uh, blogger and tweeter and uh, professor at the University of Toronto, that no one is speaking unreservedly on behalf of the institutions here. Uh, and I thought that was kind of funny that that's our big problem in our data, and yes, it's too anti-institution. But uh, that aside, I actually do think that, you know, Philip's example right here of that Mel being your free dramaturg is the example of an institution being useful to a community. That that something is an institution does not necessarily make it um, uh, against making good art or making that art that you're really power, uh, powerfully uh, connected to. It's just about whether or not the institutions choose to fulfill uh, whatever mission they think is necessary. And if there's the right pressure for them to do things like fund dramaturgs for the city, they can do that and have a, a positive contribution. And so just you know, to speak on behalf of Volker and also because I think it's a, a decent point that uh, you know, institutions themselves are not negative, just how they choose to use their resources. And the biggest resource that they have are the ability to put bums in seats, so they can bring you an audience. Uh, whereas, you know, uh, on your own, you don't have that marketing, you don't have those lists, you don't have that profile. Thanks, Holder. So, 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 so he was saying, why isn't anybody talking for the institutions? Yeah. Uh, that kind of really interesting coming from the University of Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> why do they need to talk? I'm sorry, they have publishing houses, they have professors, they have tenure, they like they have all the resources at their disposal, just like Stratford, just like the regional theaters. Um, they have their voice, they have their subscribers, they have their multi-million dollar budgets. Why do they need a voice any like why do they need more of a voice than they already have? I think that's a really interesting I'm not gonna continue. Yeah, yeah, I'm just throwing it up there. Are we gonna ask a question about the last part? Years. Sorry, I'm not at the table, I'm not at the <laughs> I just find all the talk about the institution really interesting because I'm from Nova Scotia where we don't really have that many institutions. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm interested to hear what you guys think you can do within a system of institutions when there may not really be them. Because I grew up, I didn't even grow up in Halifax. Like, there are theater companies in Halifax now, but like, I saw maybe one Neptune show growing up. I saw some community theater. Like, I didn't know big theater. Um, and I come here and I keep being told that as a maritime artist, if I want to do well, I have to go to Toronto. In fact, I got told that I had to come to school out here because I did my degree in the maritimes and they were like, but no, 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 no. And that's no offense to anyone from out here, but I'm constantly being told, you know, go back home, create theater, all this stuff here. But then when I go back home, there is not really a place for me. And the institutions that are there, there are people there just hanging on for their jobs. Like the people, there's Neptune Theater, but the same people have been employed at Neptune Theater for the last 15 years. Like, I've worked in theater for seven years and I've never done a show in Halifax. Do you want to create theater for your, for your like, like you, so, and, and this is, I wanted to introduce the word audience back into this discussion. Um, but I really perceive that the audience is the kind of guiding <coughs> institution of the theater. Because you know, you can have lots of bits and order, but you know, you don't you can have a conversation. And maybe like, you know, if you went home and it was your buddy and you wanted to make theater with like, your she was like the first audience, you know, and so it's a conspirator and then you make guilt from there. But it sounds to me that theater is important to you. 
you and your home is important to you. And so you're going to go back there and find a way to create a space uh, that can get you in conversation with your community. And that is a theater. That is the theater. You know, and so whether an institution goes out of that or not, it doesn't matter if that conversation is happening. Um, then you know you you created your place, and I think in a way that's like a really exciting opportunity. It's funny because you know when I came back from Quebec, I trained in the states, and the obvious place to go was New York. And I thought, well, you know, I have connections like this and that, and I'm like, well, why am I doing theater? Oh yes, yeah, because I want to have a conversation with my peeps. So sign our United States back to Canada, where I have a deeply, and this is I think an answer to your question: What do I desire to make work about? I have no desire to, to make work about myself and my community and the things that bind us and put us into conflict. And so I think that that, that should be your body institution. And so in Toronto, there's this magical place called Radio Dead. Um, <laughs> and the fact that you guys know about that is insane. It is their living room. <laughs>
I come from a community of uh, disability and theater and performance. And we're talking in accessibility and we're talking about seats. And quite frankly, there's a lot of theaters where a lot of individuals can't even get into the theater. Yeah. Um, and casting, um, and this is probably one of the main reasons why I came here is because it's a dialogue that's not brought up a lot. Um, it's a minority, and um, I appreciated your discussion. Sometimes we're just so bad, so I'm bringing it to something specific. Um, I want to talk about accessibility and theater. I want to talk about how people and artists with disabilities, whether they're visible or invisible, physical or developmental, how are we casting them? How are we bringing them into their schools? How are we ensuring that we're representing them in a way? I just want to talk about accessibility and what we mean by that. Um, and what are we doing as a community to support those that perhaps may not speak in English um, and probably wouldn't be able to take a, be a part of this dialogue that we're having in English and we're talking. There isn't someone that's using sign language. There isn't someone. Well, it's yeah. There's actually. And that's great. That's great. Um, and then let's talk about it then. That's awesome. Can we, can we just talk about some of the things we're doing to make theater accessible, whether it be for audiences or for artists with disabilities? Humber, Humber does that a lot. Um, and, and, you know, in open disclosure, I'm, I'm the chair of their theater advisory board. Um, <laughs> but one of the reasons that I am there is because of their, their openness and their inclusion. And, and the fact that when you go and you see Humber at the um, Ontario Showcase, when you see their classes, you will see a range of accents. You will see a range of peoples. You will see, you know, people uh, with one disability or another. They, 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 they have actively worked. I have never, I, I will this, this winter, actually have somebody signing a show that I'm doing. So it's, it's, it's one of those areas that is, that is opened up and brought and, and found a place at the table in the last few years. Um, and, and I'm sitting here trying to think of the organization in Toronto who really took it. So, you know, but you're, but you're right. I mean, it, it, the, the, the fact that you... That's right. So up until this last year, you know, you couldn't get to factory theater unless somebody was willing, and we've done this in shows, carry people up in their wheelchairs, up to flights of stairs. And frankly speaking, it'd be real hard to get upstairs to the room up there where we're going to be doing our tea come later. Native Earth got this amazing grant uh, before I joined there earlier this year um, to bring in uh, surtitles and <coughs> subtitles and have that bring in a computer and a projector as a thing and have that in place uh, for the Rutas Panamericana Festival that we co produce which is the Latin Pan American Festival. Um, and it, it was fantastic to have uh, English plays translated into Spanish, uh, Spanish plays translated into English. Um, and there was a play done earlier in our venue. It was a two-hander, and um, they they had uh, to the deaf. They had actually solicited to the deaf community, and so they brought in um, two um, sign language translators to into the rehearsal room with the actors. And on stage, the signers followed the actors, and, and they weren't off stage off to the side. And, and so. They had to work with the actors in how to translate the intentions of the acting with that, and it was so cool. It was it was such an interesting model that I hadn't heard of. That was really exciting. Could I just jump in and say, um, in uh, in February in Toronto, uh, Father's Day and Buddies and um, Progress Festival, which Summer Works is doing, there's going to be a symposium on that day, a continuing conversation that. Uh, we started last year at the Ability Center um, in just outside of Toronto, um, and uh, and you can check various websites to find that out. Uh, and then there's uh, some more conversations that are happening um, pursuant to that uh, coming out of that. So that's in February, um, and certainly there's a lot of work I think that is being uh, made um, uh, with this in mind. Um, probably not nearly enough yet, and there's also a lot of questions we're being asked right now. So it's really really great to get. That question. It's like, oh, killing back one more, one more, one more. Um, I just completely jumped in there because I end up being the fact of timekeeper, and um, uh, I was given my cue to say um, to, to wrap to wrap this conversation up and to um, 
to thank uh, everybody for participating in this really cool experiment mm -hmm. and uh, in holding the table and holding the conversation and uh, uh, hearing the various opinions uh, and getting the tweets coming from outside, getting some of those at the table. Um, to the first uh, brave uh, person from the audience who joined us and broke that uh, that gap or to cross that whatever the metaphor is. Anyway, <laughs> and other people followed. Um, uh, I always uh, I've been taught that first following is the beginning of leadership, so that was really cool. Um, I want to say thank you so much to this wonderful institution, the National Theatre School of Canada. And I want to say thank you to all of the uh, participants who spoke this morning. We kicked this off. I want to thank everyone who joined the table. I'm sorry that not everyone had a chance to, um, to uh, air your, your thoughts. I think we will continue throughout the rest of the day. And uh, and now I think, if I thank everybody that I should, I should thank the directing students, Tanya, Rachel, and Chloe. <laughs>
Way to go, girls. <laughs> um, her company, Ogala Creations, brings together artists from different disciplines to devise new work through, research, through a research and creation process that de develops over time. Ariana's work crosses multiple languages and cultures and fuses theater with dance and projection. Odela's second piece, Adam's Rib, La Mémoire du Corps, was noted for its risk-taking, emotional resonance, and evocative imagery. It's no wonder that the jury for the John Hershey Prize <coughs> stated that Ariana is the embodiment of the future of Canadian theater. Multicultural and interdisciplinary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a messenger, that's what they said. <laughs> Really, really helps me. 
But first things first, so my thank yous. Uh, thank you to the National Theatre School, number one, to Sherry B. To all the teachers that taught me that being a theatre director is indeed a life philosophy. One that stands on humility and constant questioning. A solitary job against solitude and laziness. Thank you to Rome Varma and Sarah's family. First off, for nominating me. Funny. And pushing me to reflect upon my path. And secondly, for being a continual inspiration. Thank you to my husband, Zach, who's standing out there with my baby. It was, uh, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here today. And last but not least, uh, Christine, Roman, Yael, Diana, Rose, Veronica. Thanks to all of you and to the many more radiant souls I had the chance to meet in this life. So, six days from now, I'm going to be singing the O Canada. <laughs> Together with the brand new Canadian citizens coming from the most disparate places on earth to live in this country, I will be looking at the remarkable diversity and the human potential of a truly multicultural society. I will be proud and grateful and touched, feeling a truthful protagonist of the American dream. And while swearing my oath to Queen Elizabeth, <laughs> the sensation of belonging warm in my heart, I want to resist the urge to, the urge to look around and ask myself, what makes us a community? Our new blue passports? Are we a community? And besides, does anyone around me go to see theater? <laughs> and you don't answer to that question. Talk of humility. Well, I think, I personally think community is a utopia, but a utopia worth fighting for and the necessary base for any sustainable life project. And while we, the artists, are rejoicing also the new toys of technology. We're chasing international visibility and we're worrying about our constant financial precariousness and doing a lot of good work too. I actually think there is much to do and many challenges to detect. An audience in a room is not a community either and watching a theater show is an individual, personal experience. Yet, it is an experience that happens in one place only in a portion of undivided time. Time during which, eons away from our fragmented everyday lives, an audience member can exercise his right to imagination, to marvel, and to contemplate beauty. During this unique time, he is reminded of what makes us humans, the capacity to dream, transcend, and transform oneself and oneself's reality. So, for all of us, let us make a theater of beauty, of imagination, a theater that's first action. Let us inspire to win back our full responsibility for every aspect of life, from the political to the environmental. A theater that invites us back into the democratic debate that we have been cut out from. A theater that empowers us to become the actors of a new way of living, and the caretaker of a communal project of society. In uh, six days' time, I will look at my new fellow citizens, wish them a happy life in Canada, and silently promise and hope that we will be sitting again next to each other, many and many times, imagining what has not yet been done, having visions of a possible us, and dreaming together in a dark room called Theater. Thank you.